أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين respected president of the MJC respected chairperson fellow panelists esteemed guests and colleagues my beloved brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته how are you all doing الحمد لله I'm very pleased that I've been bumped up the order because in Ramadan we operated about 50% and as we get closer to Maghrib we go into negative. So Alhamdulillah I've got uh, the prime slot Alhamdulillah. I'm very fortunate to have that. And uh, as uh, our chairperson uh, Brother Sattar mentioned, I'm here to speak a little bit about the youth as one of the youth. And I'm very happy that I'm still regarded as a, as a youth. If Mufti agrees that I'm one of the youth, and Alhamdulillah, I'm not there to have a different opinion. Alhamdulillah. Today, inshaAllah, I just would like to share with you two points. The first point, inshaAllah, before I can tell you about the first point, I want to tell you about the scariest job that I have. Uh, Satar, by mention, I wear a few kufiyas, a few hats. But there's one job in particular that's very scary for me. You know, in my role as an accountant, if I don't perform well in my job, my boss will have no choice but to fire me. And I have to watch what I say because my boss usually comes to these events. He's a wonderful boss, great person. But he'll have no choice but to fire me if I don't perform as an accountant. Similarly, Burhanul Islam Masjid, I have a wonderful committee. I love them so much. But if I don't perform as an imam, they'll have no choice but to let me go. Sheikh Alexander knows what I'm talking about. Right. Even my wife. If I don't do and play my part as a husband, she'll have no, no, you know, no option but to let me go. But one job that I can't get fired from, and this is the scariest job, and that job title is daddy. Because if I don't do my role as a father, there's no one that can replace me as the father of my children. And then I look at the world. I read the headlines in the newspapers, children being abused, the violence that's out there throughout the world, the wars... How do I prepare my kids to face this ugly world one day? And I'm sure as parents you go through the same kind of questions. How do I prepare them to face crime and corruption? How do we make sense of the divisions, the madhahib, the sects? How will I explain this to them one day so that they will make the right choices and not fall into the traps and the pitfalls? What lessons should I teach them? What books should I read to them? Are they old enough to start memorizing Zahir Bukhari? These are the questions that keep any parent up at night. So how do we prepare them for this world? How do we prepare our youth for this world? And as, as simplistic as it might sound, and if we look at the Quran and the Sunnah of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala encourages us with basically one thing: لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ to have taqwa. So to have taqwa, that sounds so simplistic. How do we face this world's challenges simply with taqwa? Well, this concept of taqwa, we hear about it quite a lot. And sometimes we refer to it as being afraid of Allah. I don't want my children to have terror when they think of Allah. Rather, taqwa is that relationship with Allah that no matter where I am, what I'm doing, I have this bond with Allah. And that's the best we could do as a parent. That if they have this relationship with Allah, that things will change, but Allah will be the constant in their life. That every decision they make must be based on their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their friends will come and go, their schools will change, their parents might even come and go. But Allah will be their constant. And if they make every decision based on that relationship, then they will make the right choices inshaAllah. They won't fall into the pitfalls, they won't go off track if they ask themselves, what would my relationship with Allah be? So that one day when they choose a profession inshaAllah, the partner they're going to get married to, what you know, what circles to, of friends to belong to, they should ask, is this good for my taqwa? And if they constantly ask that question, if our kids, your kids ask that question all the time, then inshallah they'll be safe. This reminds me of the hadith of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. When Nabi sallallahu was riding on a camel with a much younger sahabi, Ibn Abbas was a young boy. And the Prophet sallallahu could have, you know, offloaded so much information on him. And he gave him a simple hadith. He said, Ya ghulam, O young boy, let me teach you some words of advice. Remember Allah, be mindful of Allah, and Allah will protect you. Be mindful of Allah, and Allah will be in front of you. He'll always guide your way. When you ask, only ask of Allah. When you need help, only seek help from Allah. That if all the world were to come together to benefit you, 
It will not benefit you except that which Allah has prescribed for you. And if all the world were to come to harm you, no harm will afflict you except that which Allah has prescribed for you. The pain has lifted and the pages have dried. So we cannot point out, I cannot point out to my kids every division and sect and pitfall in this dunya. But I can give them this compass, inshallah, of taqwa. That if they stick to it, they will always be on the right course, inshallah. And that's one of our jobs as parents, perhaps our primary job. So that's the first point I'd like to make. Try to encourage in our kids a sense of taqwa. And how do we do that? The same way we get them to love maths, reading, our favorite sports team. We make it part of their life. We speak about Allah. We let them hear about Allah, read about Allah, listen to lectures about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's how we develop them. The second point I'd like to make, inshallah, and I would like to speak to our young people directly, to our young people, our youth directly. As Muslims, we don't believe in accidents, mistakes. No one is here by chance or by luck. Everyone here, you and I sitting here, have been put here for a reason and for a purpose. Allah put us here for a reason and for a purpose. Allah put you here for a reason and for a purpose. And we believe that every single person has been given something special to contribute to this ummah. Something amazing, something wonderful. It's your duty, your responsibility, especially as a young person, to pursue that potential. To find out what is it that Allah has given me that can change this world. You know, maybe you have the ability to cure a disease. But you'll only find that out once you start working in your biology class in high school. You might have the ability to write something amazing, a book. But it begins with your English essay in high school. And some of you might feel, well, I have, I'm good at nothing. I'm not good at academics or sports or whatever it might be. Some of the greatest minds of the century have been people that have failed and have continued to persist. Einstein, uh, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, some of the greatest people of the century are people that were seen as failures. So you might be failing, but yet you might have the greatest potential of all, the most special gift of all, something which we need and harness. And you owe it to yourself and this ummah to find out what it is. If you are between the ages of 15 and 25, you are in the most amazing decade of your life. In that decade, you will determine what job I'm going to have for the rest of my life. You probably, and we hope you're going to choose your spouse who will be with you for the rest of your life. You will choose the man and woman you want to be in this decade. And the choices you make in this decade are not just important for yourself, but it's for the ummah. The lessons you learn in your classes, in your university, will shape this ummah in years to come. What you learn in school will determine if we will liberate Palestine tomorrow. What you learn today in your high school, university, will determine if we will cure cancer tomorrow. We will solve poverty. We will be a strong and better ummah. How we will de- you know, win our challenges going forward? It depends on what you do today in your high school and university. And I know the challenges facing young people today are great and immense. Perhaps more so than ever before. The fitna is on their phone in our rooms. You can't hide from it. You can't defend yourself from it. All you have to do is face it with a sense of taqwa and a pursuit of your potential. But that should not, no matter how bad the fitna are, it should not stop you from pursuing your potential. Last night, alhamdulillah, Burhan al-Islam, we're very fortunate. We have our annual orphan program. We bring the orphans from the different uh, Muslim orphanages and give them iftar, take them out, have a word with them. I met, you know, just at one table, two amazing people, Brother Nadir. He didn't have the home that we have, parents that we have. But he has a scholarship to study at one of the best schools, high schools here in Cape Town. He's 22, Juz Hafid. Sister Mishka, 14 years old, didn't have the homes that we have, but she just completed her Quran last week, subhanAllah. So people are pursuing their potential in spite of the challenges that's out there. And that's our duty and our responsibility. As older generations, when I sit on these panels and we talk about the youth, it's never in a good context, right? It's what the youth are doing wrong, what the mistakes they're making. Older people complain. Young people are obsessed with trivial things. They are reckless. They're uncompromising, uncooperative. Well, these are the talents and the gifts we need to harness because these are the agents of change. That obsession with the trivial can be used and harnessed to be obsessed with learning new things, discovering new things. That recklessness can be the courage which gives those who are unable to speak for themselves the voice they need. Being uncooperative is good when you stand up against the status quo when the status quo is wrong. As Muslims, we don't unite on everything. We have principles and values which we stand for. 
and we don't agree with things that if things are wrong, we don't agree with them, we stand up for those things. For example, we are committed to Tawheed and worshipping Allah alone. We are committed to the supremacy of the Qur'an in spite of the views in the modern world that may say it's outdated. We are committed to the love of the Prophet ﷺ, his family and his companions. We stand out against groups that call for violence against innocent people because they differ from us. Against government corruption and abuse of power. We stand up against that. And it requires young people to take those challenges forward. It takes young people to bring about those changes. And if you are a young person, and I know a lot of our panelists will speak about changing a society constructively to our young people, I would like to say something to you. That if you want to change something in your community, your masjid, your madrasa, your institute, step number one, be part of that masjid. Be committed to that masjid. Criticize with love and care. Avoid controversial areas and issues. Youth is the time to acquire and learn. Focus on the things that are clear, that every group, denomination, madhab, religion can affirm as being good. Focus on that. Don't be quick to judge and come to conclusions. Chances are the conclusions you have today will change 10 years from now and 10 years later. Don't judge people. And don't ever think as right as you are and as wrong as the other person is that you can be disrespectful. Never was ever a Nabi of Allah disrespectful. Even Nabi Musa was required to be respectful to Fir'aun. Young, you know, so one of the other issues that our elders like to mention about the youth is look, the radicalization of youth. Going to certain groups and sects, becoming extreme. They say they ask controversial questions. They have radical views, radical goals. They are extreme in their pursuits. And while that is a danger, a bigger danger for us as an ummah are the many, many millions of youth that ha are not asking enough questions, that have no goals and no pursuits. That's far more a danger to us. As, as our chairman mentioned, one of the hadith I, I share with you is the hadith of the Muslim body. That the Prophet says the ummah is like one, the believers are like one body. That if one part of the body is injured, the entire body suffers from the pain and the fever. Well, we are one body. And in a time like this, when the ummah is bleeding, we should all be suffering. But very importantly to our young people, if one organ in our body isn't functioning, then the whole body is sick. We are completely disabled. That the youth, you are a major part of this ummah. And we have lost too many generations of youth not coming to the party. The ummah, the scholars agree. One thing they all agree on is that the ummah is not in a great shape. And we need our youth to play this role in the ummah. This was part of the sunnah of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You would, be, you would struggle to think of a companion older than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Most of the sahaba were younger than him. He empowered and inspired the youth. And they played their role. They are the ones that took this ummah forward. And this ummah has a history. It's written with people who pursued their potentials and overcome difficulties and took this ummah forward. If we look at our own society, our little part of the ummah here in Cape Town, we are a miracle, we shouldn't be here. We came as exiles and slaves, faced oppression, tyranny, colonialism, apartheid. All those systems are gone and yet here we are and we remain. And we've built a society, the legacy of our parents. They've built masajid, schools, madaris, halal institutions, universities, radio stations, CEOs of the, best com the top companies in South Africa, members of parliament, judges, captain of our cricket team. This is what our forefathers did in this little community here in Cape Town. And the question is, what will your contribution be? What diseases are you going to cure? What problems are you going to solve? What inventions are you going to discover? Young people are doing this today. A colleague of mine in high school went on a few months ago to discover a cure for a disease that might save many, many lives, inshallah. A young man in the crowd here, and I won't mention his name because he'll pelt me to death. In his 20s, he started a website, Muslim Central, biggest website on earth of Islamic English audio lectures on earth here in Cape Town. Same skills, same abilities, same opportunities like me and you, but they pursue that potential to change the world. What contribution will you do as a young person? If you are in your teens or in your 20s or in your 30s, don't think that this is a problem for the ulama or the committee or the chairperson. No, it's a problem that you must have. And Nabi Sallallahu gave responsibility to, his, to the youngsters. 
A beautiful story I like to narrate to you about the Prophet ﷺ. When they conquered Mecca, Bilal gave the adhan for the first time in Mecca. Can you imagine the scene? Bilal getting on the Kaaba, giving the adhan. One of the youth of Mecca who wasn't, you know, a group of youngsters messing around, they heard Bilal, they started mimicking and mocking Bilal secretly. But the Prophet ﷺ heard them. And when he came in, he asked him, who was that that teased and made fun of Bilal? Now everyone is quiet, right? No one is the tough guy now. And he tested them one by one. You give the adhan, you give the adhan, you give the adhan. Until he found the guy who did it. And he said, you know what? You have a nice voice. And in Tirmidhi, it says, the Prophet taught this young boy who teased Bilal word for word, the adhan and the iqamah. And he said, I appoint you the mu'addin of Makkah. You will give the adhan in the haram from going forward. Subhanallah. He took a delinquent youth, gave him responsibility, empowered him, gave him position. First mu'addin of Makkah. Hadith is in Tirmidhi. So what will be your legacy? What will be the thing that you leave behind for this ummah? And what impact will you have? I said all along, point number two was to pursue your potential. I don't say fulfill your potential. Because Allah doesn't require us to bring about results. Allah says spend. Whether the masjid gets built or the hospital gets built, that's up to Him. You just give your best. Allah says call people to the path. Whether they accept or not, it's not your concern. You do the hard work. Allah says, make jihad in the sabirillah. Whether we succeed or fail in the battle, the point is you make the struggle. So the effort is what's counted. And you need to ask yourself, where's my effort being, where's my effort going to? As an ummah, we can't allow our efforts and our talents to be wasted in front of the television, the Xbox, sports teams, whatever it might be. If we combine as a young people, combine taqwa as our guide and our compass, and our effort and our pursuit and the talents that Allah has given us, then subhanallah, this ummah has a bright future. The ideas, the possibilities are endless. And the impact this generation can have on this ummah, we can't even begin to dream about it. That we could be the generation, that future generations will look back on, that our kids 40 years from now when they give this talk will say, our parents solved the crisis in the Middle East. They solved global warming. They found new sources of energy. They cured diseases. That's what our parents gave. That future generations should look back at our generation and say, we want to be like them. They are the standard we want to aspire to be. We can do it. And I make dua, inshallah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses each and every one of us, our young and our old. May Allah have mercy on those who have passed away. May Allah accept from us what we have done thus far in Ramadan and grant us only the best of what remains. I thank you so much for your time. Wa sallallahu sayyidina Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. MashaAllah. Sheikh Muhammad West, a very beautiful, a very inspiring talk here today, a very overall comprehensive talk on a youth perspective opening up the uh, uh, function here today. Just want to mention before I call upon